Okay, so a couple of quick announcements. I did forget to publish the 3.8 discussion. Luckily, it's literally one theorem and then a couple of examples. So when I talk about the theorem today, I'm going to give it to you what it is, and then we're actually going to apply it. Okay. Um, so I want you to watch the 3.8 discussion because I'm going to go over, I think, two examples from Webassign, but I think there's like two more in there, or maybe just one more, but I think there's two. Um, and then that way you have another reference to help you with the web assign. Okay? But we will go over a couple of them today. Um, the 3.7 you guys did already watch. I just put it in there in case anyone hadn't seen it yet. They can go back and do it on partial credit, right? Um, but this one I did do the deadline today. Since we are talking about it today, you probably want to get in there and see what it looks like after you saw it. Um, and then today we're going to cover both of the sections. They're not very lengthy. They're literally just here's two facts and I'll apply them. Okay. Um, and then after that is the link to take the test two review. I just put that in there right now. Um, so take a look at it. If there's some problems in there that you think you might have questions about, or if you have time to try the review and you have questions, targeted questions, um, that's what we'll be doing in class on Thursday. Okay. So Thursday could potentially be a very short class if no one has any questions, okay? So be prepared with questions over that review, okay? Um, and then the last two chapter three assignments are also going to have a deadline of Friday, okay? So all the coursework for this whole unit should be completed by Friday, okay? Um, then the test will actually be that following Monday, okay? Um, just to give you guys a heads up, I will not be here that Monday. It's like, what is it, Indigenous Peoples Day or old school was Columbus Day, right? And all my kids are off of school. <laughs> so um, I figured this is the only class I'm teaching that day. I don't have the other one. Um, actually, no, that's on Monday. That's not on Tuesday. So our test is on Tuesday. I will be here that Tuesday. So we're all good. Um, but my Monday class, I'm going to get a sub for them because just getting into giving a test, right? Um, well, that doesn't apply to this one, actually. Um, I'll be here on that day, and we're going to do the same thing as we did before. So we'll have the paper and pencil test in class. But if you choose to take the test online, you need to let me know ahead of time, OK? So by Friday, please send me a message, an email, a text, anything to let me know that you intend to take the test online versus in class, if that's what you're going to do. Okay. If I don't get any message from anyone or from each specific person by Friday, then I'm just going to assume you're going to do the paper pencil test and I'm going to bring an extra copy for you. Okay. Um, I won't change gears. So once Friday hits, that's it. I got to push the test out. Okay. So make sure you let me know by Friday night. Okay. Um, any questions about that? Doing the test online versus in paper? Because I know only one person has done it that way. Not everyone has just yet. Okay. It's just an option. Okay. Um, so we're going to go ahead and talk about 3.7. I know most of you got through that um, discussion. And so you might have an idea of how to do the problems, but there are three rules that we need to use. And I'm actually going to have them on my paper, on my computer, side by side. So I'm going to put this over here. Let me shrink this a little bit. And then I actually have the formulas inside Canvas, right? So where are those formulas? I thought I had them at the beginning. Nope. Oh, they're in the review, though. I'll click on the review. So the review does have all the formulas. If I click preview, you see that big one sheet that I gave you guys at the beginning of the semester, right? This one, this one has all the rules that I need for 3.7. Okay. And if I keep scrolling, there are your geometric formulas, right? I told you to be provided like a whole bunch of them, even though you probably don't need maybe just one of those. I think two on the review, okay? But they're all there. Um, and then the Newton's method is also here, okay? So we'll talk about this Newton's method a little bit, but you do have everything that you would need. Most of the majority of what you're going to need is right in here. Okay? Um, it does cover all the rules. You might not notice, but number three, 
if I do like a magnification of this. Oh, it doesn't make my document bigger. Dang it. It just makes all the words bigger. Um, but I don't know if you can see that. It also has the full set wall, right? So it has the bottom, center, the top, minus the top, center, the bottom, over, top, So the bottom field and full set wall are in there. And Kano is throughout the whole thing. You see those little blue signs everywhere? That's the Kano logo. Okay. So Kano is already included. Now in 3.7, they were basically concentrating on Kano too. Okay. So when you take the derivative of an inverse function, now in the past we've always written them as like sign with a little negative one superscript like this, right? When you learned them in trig, they were written like that. But we now know that that's the same thing as saying arc sign. Okay, okay, they are the same thing. So and I wanted to point that out because I noticed in the review, I did not use this for whoever learned. Oh, but they don't use this notation, they use this notation. Okay. We have to make sure that you don't use um, So they are the same thing. So when you see them in this chart, they may not have the sign negative one, but we can still apply all the little words. Okay. So what I'm going to do is this is just basically for my own reference. I'm going to write down. Um, the formula that I would need for this particular problem. So this is like web assign number two. And if I'm looking at this, it says arc cosecant, right? So on my paper, I want to find the formula for arc cosecant, which is actually rule number 24. So I'm gonna write that down in red. Um, I think they use a U. And what they get is negative u prime over the absolute value of u, and then the square root of u squared minus one. Okay. So let me minimize this and make this bigger. So that is the rule that I just jotted down. I'm just trying to make it big, sorry. We're moving it around so much. Okay, so essentially what I need to do is I just need to figure out what U is and then what U prime is. Once I know what U is and what U prime is, it's literally just plugging it in and then maybe seeing if it can simplify, okay? So in this case, notice where the U is at over here. It's essentially just whatever I'm taking the arc cosecant of, right? So when I go to do my work, I'm gonna say um, U is going to be this thing because that's what I'm taking the arc cosecant of, negative nine T squared. And then if I try to find U prime, what is the derivative of this negative nine T squared? Mm -hmm. Negative 18 T. And so now I'm just gonna apply my rule and say that F prime, my derivative is this, but with my U's and my U primes, okay? So I'm gonna have negative U prime, which was negative 18 T over the absolute value of U, which was negative nine T squared. And then the square root of U squared negative nine T squared squared, right? This guy squared, and then the whole thing is squared minus one. Now, I'm not sure how picky web assign is, so web assign may take this, they may not, okay? But I promise if it's on the test, it's not, the final choices are not gonna be written like that, okay? One thing for sure is that double negative, right? This double negative just means I have positive 8t in the numerator, 18t. Now the bottom's a little bit trickier. You have to think about that one for a minute. 
I can square nine and I can square t squared. I get positive 81 t to the fourth. That's not the one that I'm gonna think about too much. This is the one I'm gonna think about. <laughs> so what's the absolute value of negative nine? Nine. What's the absolute value of t squared? Yes. Do you know why? Why does the bottom go away for the t squared part? So, well, yeah. No, that's not true. That's sort of true. Sort of, sort of, sort of. But no matter what t is when I square it, what's it always going to be? Positive, right? That's kind of what you're trying to say, right? <laughs> but no matter what this little value is, when I square it, this is always positive. So, do I really need the bars when you have a positive number inside? Doesn't it just come out like the way it was, right? If it was a five inside the bars, it just come out of the five, right? So, since I know that this guy's positive, no matter what t is, you don't need the bars on, okay? Square, be careful though, because if it was just t or t cubed. That is not always positive, depending on what t is, right? Because if t were a negative, then t would be a negative, or t cubed would be a negative. And so the bars wouldn't go away, they'd be stuck right here. You could take the number out, but you'd be stuck with bars around the ground. Okay? So be very, very careful with the bars. You just got lucky because it was t squared. Does anything else stick out to you that could be simplified? This stuff? That can be simplified. How? No, you cannot. There's a rule that says this. There's no rule that says this. Those are not equal. Okay. So you cannot ever, 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 ever take the square root of terms. The only way you could possibly do it is if you factored it. Okay. And unfortunately, I have a difference of two squares, right? So if I factor, I'm not going to get one with a plus and one with a minus. Not somebody squared. Okay. You can make the house go away. If it was something squared, then the house would go away. Okay. But it's not going to work like that. But I need you guys to say stuff so I can write this stuff. So we'll do that. Okay. So we've got to know the intent. Now, somebody else was saying another idea. So what's happening? Anyone, you can just say it on. I can hear both. I have like multiple children. <laughs> I can hear the these, these guys or these guys? People that are not in the house, right? People that are not in the house can simplify. Yes. So the 18 and the 9 and then the two T's can also simplify. So this T will wipe out one of those T's. And then 9 goes into 9 once. 9 goes into 18 twice. So we end up with just the two on the top and just the T at the bottom. And I'm trying to squish it in here. <laughs> I need it in there. But so gravity has the same property. Do you want to see the whole thing? Yeah. Is that as much as I can do? Sure. Say it again. Um, in which set? You could, you could, mm -hmm. you want to. If this matches what you have in your choices, you wouldn't need to, right? But if you notice in, because that's a good thing to bring up. If you notice in your choices that there's no radical in the denominator in your choices, then you know you have to do what? This one, yes, because there's, yes. <laughs> I don't want people having to type all this in there. I mean, you have to show your steps and how you got it, but you'll have like choices to pick. Yeah. You'll kind of see, but be careful because I do, not just me, but all the faculty, we do the problems wrong, the common way that people do them wrong so that we can get the little choices in there. So just because you've got something that matches doesn't necessarily mean a good thing. So be very, very careful. <laughs> um, okay, but yes, if I notice in all my choices that there's no power in any of my choices, 
then you probably need to rationalize it, right? You can do that. And if I'm going to rationalize a radical, you literally just multiply by the same radical, but on the top and the bottom. So we get two times this radical, and then we get t times that radical squared because it's that times itself at the bottom, right? This guy comes to that. So then my little square is going to pop off the house, and so you just get two, and then at the bottom I get t times eighty-one t to the fourth minus one. With no more radicals. One last thing that is possible. That's the only thing you could even possibly do. So if this one wasn't in the choices, then hopefully 81 t to the fifth minus t. But I didn't. The answer choices come from the computer, and then sometimes the instructors modify them. And so, if the answers have a pattern, the instructors usually just follow the pattern. So, definitely don't rationalize. Yeah, okay. Um, let's try this one though. So that one was pretty straightforward as far as applying the rule. We just wrote down the rule, figured out what u and u prime were, and then worked it all out, right? This one's a little bit different because it's not just this guy by itself, right? You've got this other factor. Unfortunately, you have something with x in it, and then something else with x in it. And if they're multiplied together, what do you have to do? Yes. <laughs> it's just a different system to Same thing. I didn't want to do your problem, so I did my own, but it's very similar. All the, uh, the rules that we apply will be the same. The only thing that will be different is I will be using this rule for the cosine. I'll be using it for cosine instead of sine. Okay. So, I do have something times something else. So I have to apply the product rule. I don't have a choice when it comes to that. So when I find u prime, I'm going to have to do the first factor times the derivative of the second factor, which I don't want to do yet because it's too much, plus the second factor times the derivative of the first factor. And I'll just write it. So I haven't done the derivatives yet. I'm just telling you what I have to do, right? So I have the first guy times the derivative of the second guy plus the second guy times the derivative of the first guy. But I haven't actually done those derivatives. Now here though, if I look for the rule for arc cosine, so bear with me, I'm gonna make this go away for just a minute. Dun, 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 cosine, and these are not one of the ones that I remember. So, <laughs> v, v, x, arc, cosine of u is going to be negative u prime over square root of one minus u squared. So I just wrote the problem here. So in my case, in this case, what is u? It's x. And then what is u prime? Just one. So when I go to take this derivative, I'm going to apply that formula. So I'm going to get negative one, because that's u prime, over the square root of one minus, and u is x and it has to get squared. Okay. 
Now over here on the other side, what is the derivative of e to the minus? Say again. Okay. Mm -hmm. It is nine e to the nine x. So when we're doing derivatives of exponentials, it's the same thing, right? But if that exponent is not x, you have to multiply by the derivative of it, right? So what's the derivative of nine x? Nine, which is why he said it's just nine e to the nine x. Okay. Okay. So let's see how we can do this. We can multiply basically top times top. So negative e to the 9x over the square root of 1 minus x squared plus 9e to the 9x arc cosine x. Now, whatever sign takes this, so you just always type that in there. As long as you kind of put it together a little bit, it'll take it. Um, but if you see that the problem sounds a little radical in the then go ahead and rationalize that radical. Okay. So you'll basically end up with this guy times the radical and then this down here with no house. If I multiply the house top and bottom, the top doesn't really do anything, it stays. But if you have another radical at the bottom, then you set the radical free, right? So you just take the radical to the top of the minus x. That's just in case. But for me, I like this one. This one's okay. As long as you get one giant fraction, well, it's hard to get. Okay, I have one more. This one's like number nine. Now there's a big one that I did in the video, so make sure you watch it because there's one like that in the whole thing. Um, but I saw this one in number nine, and it's also kind of like the other one where it's finding some extra rules. So be careful, there may not be parentheses around this guy in number nine, but you do have to be able to distinguish what your angle is for your arc, or not your angle, but your value for the arc time. If this parentheses isn't there, you should be asking for clarification. Is it this that you're taking the arc tan of, or is it all of that that you're taking the arc tan? Okay. So here I put the parentheses there if they weren't there already. This is like you know, <laughs> not taking arc tan of both of those terms. Okay, it's just the one term. So for this part, let me write down the rule. I think this one does not have a house, if I remember correctly. Yep. So d dx of arc tan of u is just u prime over one plus u squared. So that's my rule there. So if I go up here and I figure out what is u for my arc tan? What am I taking the arc tan? Oh. Mm -hmm. X over four. But if that's you, what is you prime? I don't have to do quotient rule. Isn't this the same thing as one fourth times X? Um, what's the derivative of anything with an X? It's that number, right? So it's just one fourth. You could do quotient rule, but it'd be long for nothing, right? <laughs> I think the online class took their test already. No, they didn't. They're behind the time. Okay, so I'm going to put that in, but oh, it's going to make a complex problem. It's okay. People know how to deal with it, right? 
but I don't like that I have to deal with it. <laughs> so I'm going to get u prime, which was one fourth, over one plus u, which was x over four squared. Now that's the derivative of the first term. I do have to do minus, but then I also have to do the derivative of the second term. Okay? And for this one, you do need to do so or you need to rewrite that. Okay, and then you pull it. I'm just gonna go ahead and do quotient rule because it seems like <laughs> when I've done a few of these that it's just already in its nice little fraction form when you do it in quotient rule. Whereas if you do it where you write one half and then this guy with a negative one exponent and then a cross table, it doesn't look nice when it's done. Okay, you have to put it back into its fraction form, possibly combine like terms, and it's the whole thing. Okay. Whereas when you use quotient rule, it's already all there. So I'm going to go ahead and do a bracket because that minus applies to the entire quotient rule. So I get low d high, what's the derivative of the one? Zero minus high d low. Now this two is just a constant multiplier, but what's the derivative of x squared plus 16? 2x, mm -hmm. you got it. And then at the bottom, I'm gonna have low squared. So this guy essentially is not even there, right? It's just zero. And what's gonna happen when you do a negative times a negative? It's gonna become plus four X over. And then what happens if I square this? Because there is a rule for that. Just like when you're multiplying to the house, this rule comes from this rule. Okay, so this rule comes from this rule. Okay, so this is a one half exponent, right? And then you just give each person the one half exponent, okay? But it applies for all exponents, not just one half exponent. So if I have two things that are multiplied together, this little guy, that guy, and I'm squaring it, I'm answering the same subtraction. I cannot square the x squared and the 16 in the radius. I can use the plus sign. And the product can be treated as x squared. Okay? So if the two things are squared, and this whole thing gets squared. Which gives me four and then x squared plus 16 squared. That will reduce, but we'll mess with it in a minute. Let me fix that first fraction. What do we get when we do x over four squared? X squared, uh huh, over what? 16. And then I can simplify the second fraction. This one's okay. I think this one's okay. This one, though, how do you get rid of the complexity of the fraction? Mm -hmm. And there's only two of them, right? So between those two, what's the least common denominator? It is 16. If you struggle with knowing what the least common denominator is, just multiply two things together and then multiply everybody by that. Okay, and that gives us the 64, right? All that's going to happen if you multiply by 64 and 64 is you'll realize that you cancel out a little four days. And so it truly should have been 16. Okay, but yes, it is 16. How do we know? We list the factors and then we write the ones they have in common, which they have different, right? So for four, it's two times two. For 16, it's two times two times two times two. You write the ones they have in common. And then you write the ones that they have different. And so I end up getting just the same. Okay. That's the same as it was. You don't want to algebra it. Whatever your denominators are, the factors that are in common only get written once. And then the extra factors that they different sides. <laughs> so the different ones, the distinct ones, so here it is. And then you can multiply everybody. So I am going to use 16. 
So 16 here, 16 here, and 16 there. And these fours I'm going to knock out. So we end up with 4 over 16 plus x squared, and then x over x squared plus 16 squared. I and in the answer questions, it most likely will have it written as one fraction. What would be the common denominator here? Mm -hmm. It's x squared plus 16 squared, or this x squared. Aren't they the same thing? Right? It doesn't matter whether you're adding the front or the back, right? So the same. So this is the same as this, except that one squared, right? So if I were to list all the factors, it's basically that denominator has one of them, and then the other denominator has two of them, doesn't it? I write the one they have in common, and then the next one. So it would be squared. Okay, that is going to be your common denominator. So we'll multiply the top and the bottom of this fraction so that it could have the same denominator. And then if, since they have the same denominator, you can write them together. <clears throat> so I just distributed my four in the numerator and I got these two terms and then I brought down these. The only thing that you might see different in the answer choice is we might have different denominators, but it shouldn't have changed. Okay. So this test and even the next one, there's going to be a lot of algebra required. It just is. Okay. Um, so try to show like how your answer matches whatever the answers they have. I need you to start practicing that algebra. <coughs> um, but that is it for this one. 3.8 is like a whole nother animal. They're not trying to teach us anything new as far as more derivative rules. Okay, so you've got the derivative rules. We've covered pretty much all of them. The only ones that we haven't really talked about is the hyperbolic sine, hyperbolic cosine, or like S I N H or C O S H, right? In the sheet. I don't know what that is. I feel like I just try something in there. Okay. Um, these guys right here. So you see S I N H C O T H. I mean, it's not nothing too fancy that we couldn't figure out, but we just don't cover them. We don't even hardly ever use them. Think how to you'll see them, but you don't have to take the derivative of them. <clears throat> okay. So moving on to 3.8. We definitely need to know what the rule is. So I'm going to write down that rule. Now this one, if you can see that, I'll try. I don't think it makes it bigger if I do it. Move this up a little. So it says x equal to zero. Um, basically, what you can do is you can figure out this x value or at least get an estimate that is super, super close. Okay. So normally, when they ask you for a solution, um, 
they either ask you for two types of answers, the exact answer, right, or an approximate answer, which means you usually get a decimal and round it and then stick that in the computer. Right? Well, with this Newton's method, it essentially lets you get the approximation answer, which is the correct uh, decimal plate, but it won't let you get the exact answer. Okay. The only way it'll somehow miraculously come out to the exact answer is if you got like an answer of like two or one or an integer of some type. Okay. Um, normally they're just random decimals, and that probably means that you've got either an ln, a trig function, an e, or radicals, something going on in your answer that's causing it to just get that. Um, but this is the rule that we're going to apply most frequently and we can't forget. So I have it on this sheet of paper. Essentially, what it does is it gives you a way to find these approximations. And what you do is you start off with a guess. Okay? <laughs> I think in that orange little note bar, it says you usually want to graph it so that you can kind of have an idea of where your guess is at. Okay. So when you're asking someone to find where f of x equals zero, you're essentially, if you have your curve, right, you're asking them where the y value is zero. So you're asking for this number, this number, and this number, okay? Now, one of those I can clearly see it looks like it's at zero, right? But the other two, what if they're like in between answers, right? They're not exactly on the number, they're in between, and you don't know what that exact value is, okay? Or a decimal that's really, 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 really close to that exact value, okay? That's what Newton's method allows us to do. And if you go through the proof and all that stuff, I'm, never, I'm more of an application part, not necessarily the proof part. Um, you could look it up, watch a video about it and all that, and they'll explain like how they're using the tangent lines and then this and little triangles to try to get get closer and closer to that value. Okay. But what you would do is you would look at this graph and you would guess. I think this is close to this value, isn't it? So I would guess one, one, negative two, negative three. I would guess that this is pretty close to negative three. Okay. And if I were trying to figure this one out, I would say it's pretty close to three, right? Positive three. And so I would use three as my initial guess. All this does is once you know what your guess is, you can stop doing anything and then it gives you a second closer guess. Okay. And if you use that new guess in here and here and in here, then you can get an even closer guess. And then if you use that one, it gets the called iteration. So you keep going in the circle, right? Okay. And the more iterations you do, the closer and closer and closer you get to that approximate value. Okay. Now normally for us, we only Packed around to like three decimal places or four decimal places, right? That kind of thing. So normally, once our guesses start looking the same four places after the decimal, we can stop doing iterations because we don't need to know about all the other decimals. We just need to know the first four and what those look like, right? Um, and so that's how you know when to stop. Is they'll tell you, figure it out, and then go to this many place value. And then you just keep doing it until you get to that many place values and then you go. Okay. Now, one of the problems really, really tries to coach you through it, which is not my favorite problem. They're like really trying to hold your hand, but to me, they just make me do more stuff than I want to. Um, so I wanted to go over this problem. This one's like number one in the 3.8. And it's actually like numbers one through four. The only thing that changes is the function and the guess that they give. Okay. So there's not much changing in problems one through four other than what function you're using. For this one, no. There are some later, like this one does not give me a guess, but it gives me a picture, which kind of helps, right? If you didn't have the picture, then you would have to draw the picture. But Normally, you're either given a picture or you're given an extra and um, a guess. Okay. So, for here, they did tell us to calculate just two iterations. So, we don't have to do it so many times. 
just two iterations using the Newton's method for the function using the given initial guess. And it says round the four decimal places, okay? So every time I try to enter something in a box, if it's supposed to be this long decimal, just put it to four decimal places, okay? Now, the thing that I don't like is I usually just do this and this. I don't ever do the itty bitty pieces, okay? So I don't like that they're forcing me to do these three pieces. I usually just go with the numbers and then this in my calculator, okay? So when I get to the next example, you'll see me just use these two boxes pretty much, okay? I don't use the ones in the middle. But because they put it in there for one through four, I wanted you to see how that all plays out, okay? So the first thing we have is f, right? f of x is this. And we're also going to need f prime. So what's f prime of x? 2x. And so then let's see what we get for these first few boxes. So my first guess for n1, right, it's x1. They tell me that x1 is 2. So I know that 2 goes in this box. So that's my initial guess. Then what they're asking for here is essentially just f of 2. Well, what do you get when you plug in 2 in here? Would you say negative what? Negative three. Mm -hmm. And so that's what they're wanting in this box. Now, what happens if you plug in two into the derivative? I'm not going to write that. What do you get? You get four. And so then that's what they're wanting here. And then if you were to take one of them divided by the other, if you were to take that guy divided by that, it does not simplify. It's just state negative three over four, but it wants decimals, right? So negative three over four as a decimal is negative 0 0.75. I haven't needed to use four decimals yet. And then the last one is basically x in, the guy you started with minus this box. So what do I get when I do two minus negative 0 0.75? That double negative is actually gonna add it, isn't it? And so I actually get 2.75. So that is a closer approximation to the actual answer. So what I'm going to do now for the second iteration is use that closer approximation as my second x value. So down here, this is going to become that 2.75. Okay, and then I just repeat the whole process all over again, right? So what is f of 2.75? I'm not sure. 2.75 squared minus seven, I get this decimal. And it is four decimal places, so I'm just gonna type it in there like that. Now, when I plug it into F prime, I just get two times 2.75, which is 5.5. I don't need to round that, it's just 5.5. Now, this one's weird because of decimals, right? So I need to do the original function value over the derivative value. So in my calculator, I have to do the 0 0.5625 over the 5.5, right? This one over that one. Now I have to chop this one off. So that seven will change this two to a three. So it becomes 0 0.1023. And then now for the very, very last box is to take that first box here and subtract what you got in this third box, the fourth box actually. So I'm gonna do 2.75 minus 0 0.1023. 
one zero two three, and I get two point six four seven seven. So that's what they're wanting from you in problems one through four. Okay. So there's not a lot of like stuff you have to think about. You just have to kind of follow the pattern, right? And so it's getting closer and closer. It went from two to okay, one minute of gas, a little bit over, but now going back a little bit, and it'll probably struggle until it gets right to that number, whatever it is. So if I were to keep doing more iterations, right? And there's my number line. I get two and three. It took me from here to here, right? Then it took me to point six, right? And it probably will give me another one closer and closer and closer and closer to get like right over there. Okay. That's essentially what's happening. It's just getting closer and closer to that actual value. Okay. Now there's another kind of problem where they word it different, but they do give us a picture. So I had one of those picked. So this one's like number five, okay? So number five says, apply Newton's method to approximate the X values of the indicated point or point. Mine is just one, okay? So there's no S, it's just the indicated point of intersection of two graphs. Continue the iterations until two successive approximations differ by less than, not that, by less than 0 0.001, okay? What that means is that even though this only has three decimal places, I need this one to also be the same, okay, this fourth one. So if that fourth one is also the same, then I will have the correct approximation. So if you're just wanting like a quick little tidbit, whatever they tell you here, Go to the one more decimal. Okay. And then they'll be the same again that 0 .001 interval. The other thing is, is that, and in the video, we talked about it, but they did give us the hint. I didn't mean to give it to you, they let us all do it. There's two functions, right? And I'm not asking, and they're not asking, sorry, they're not asking for the y intercept of either one of these things. What they're asking for is where the two functions intersect. And so then they give us this hint and they say, actually, it has to be the zero of this thing. Okay. And why is it that they're wanting us to approximate the zero of S minus G? And it has to do with the fact that you're trying to figure out what F of X equals G of X, aren't you? Right. And so if I were to subtract G of X on both sides, I'd end up with this. And if you define that as H of X, you're essentially doing the same thing as so for my particular problem, my h of x is actually going to be this f function minus the g function. And it's just one house, so I don't need parentheses or anything. So that's my function. And I want to know where this function is because if I know where that function equals zero, then I know where this equals zero, since I know where f equals zero. They did give me the graph. I don't think they gave me this. They only gave me that. But I knew that with x plus seven, it was the square root all the way shifted to negative seven. And so I just finished the rest of the graph. But they only give you like this little area. Looking at that graph, and I didn't do it on graph paper. <laughs> So what would you use if everyone is going to be different, okay? If someone gets us a little bit closer, they might not have to do as many iterations. If someone gets us a little bit further, they might have an extra iteration, okay? That's all that it boils down to. But if you look at this graph, what x value would you think that maybe that's happening at? 0.39 and somebody said 0.5. Both of those are perfect to use in the iteration, okay? Both of them are perfectly fine. You will just keep doing iterations until you get to where the numbers are exactly the same. After two iterations, they'll be exactly the same number at four decimal places, okay? So take a vote. Who wants to do 0.5? 
Nobody who wants to do 0.39. Okay, we got our two times. <laughs> two is more than zero. <laughs> so we'll do 0.9. So our initial guess is going to be 0 0.39. Okay. What that means is that X1, my first first guess, is 0 0.39. Okay. Now, if I want to find my second guess, my second guess in plus one is going to be x to the n minus f of x to the n over f prime x to the n. But I'm not using f. Aren't the function I'm trying to do is h? So I'm just going to change this general f to an h. So that's what I'm trying to do. Well, I have h, right? But I don't have h prime. So we definitely need to figure out what h prime is before I can continue. Now I'm going to rewrite h first as x plus 7 to the 1 half power. Right? When I go to find h prime, what's the derivative of 2x? 2. What's the derivative of 2? 0. So minus, and then what's the derivative of this? One half x plus seven to the negative one half. And then yes, the chain rule, but it's just times one, right? So if I clean that up, it's gonna be two minus one over two square root of x plus seven, okay? Right, so this is a one half. So a one is at the top of the fraction, and two is the bottom of the fraction, and same thing that. And then the negative means we're downstairs, right? And one half means radical. So it should be a radical downstairs. And that one really isn't going to be the right one point one. So what I'm going to program in my calculator, and it's going to look really ugly, is I'm going to program the calculator like this. because this is the fastest way to do it, is you're gonna have x minus, and then h of x, which is two x plus two minus the square root of x plus seven over the derivative, two minus one over two square root of x plus seven. Now I could mess around with that and try to make it look prettier, but I don't need to because I'm just gonna stick it in the calculator, okay? We don't have to algebraically manipulate this at all, okay? So here's where I'm going to go. My first guess is 0 0.39. If I want to get my second guess, I have to plug 0 0.39 into this expression. Okay. So I'm going to do 0 0.39 stores x so that after I type all this in there, I don't get an error. I did that yesterday. <laughs> I was practicing on one of the problems that I I guess x was zero the last time. And then when I tried, I entered the whole thing. And then when I hit enter, it said like domain error. And then when I click clear, I, the whole thing went away. <laughs> so make sure you store your x value first before you do all the work to get this in your calculator. Okay, so now I'm gonna try to put all of this in blue. So I'm gonna use my variable x and then minus and a fraction symbol and then two x plus two minus square root of x plus seven. And then at the bottom, I have to type two minus another fraction, one over two square root of x plus seven. So I do not need to mess with it. As long as it looks exactly like what's on my paper, you're good to go, you can press enter. Okay, say it again. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so does it look exactly like what I have? It does, right? Hopefully, if it doesn't let me know because I don't want to press enter unless it does. Okay, so I'm going to hit enter and let's see what we get. We get this number. So I get zero 
0.356111 and it just keeps going, right? Okay. These are not the same because this is like a zero, zero, isn't it? They are not the same, those first four decimals, are they? So we have to do it again, okay? The nice thing is, is that you have this number right there in your calculator. So all you have to do is hit store X and hit enter. And now X is that weird number, okay? Then you go up here and find that ugly expression again and just copy it and hit enter and it's gonna plug in your second guess. And now we get this number, 0 0.356107 dot, 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 right? Are these the same first four digits after the decimal? They are, which means you can stop at this point, okay? And so if you were to round this, your answer would just be 0 0.3561, okay? So you get the same answer. So that was pretty good guess. If you had tried 0.5, you probably would have had to do like four or five iterations before you got them to match the first four digits, okay? But it wouldn't have been wrong. It would have been totally okay. So that's pretty much it with Newton's method. Now, Newton's method seems kind of out of place considering that we're just doing nothing but derivatives. But it is kind of a segue into the next section because the next section is about applications. Of this is one of the applications of derivatives. And this Newton's method, I literally did it for my test and then forgot all about it. Go ahead. Always compare the last two iterations. So if I had done it again, I'd compare one to two. And had I done it again, I'd compare one to two. Right, and that's the number that you try to get to. But you just don't know what it is until you get there. Sure. So I never used Newton's method, but then when I got to Cal 3, they gave me a problem and it's like, you had to find where the thing equals zero. And I was like, I don't know how to graph that. I don't know any technique on how I'm gonna figure out where this function equals zero. And then I remembered the Newton's method and I was like, oh, haha, I don't have to guess it to like a certain decimal point. So I just applied Newton's method and I got the answer. So it works. Anything, any function that you're trying to get equal to zero, you can apply Newton's method now that you got to do derivatives, okay? And anything, even did it in, they just had like this kind of weird polynomial like this. And I couldn't factor it, I couldn't, I could have done some other weird algebra stuff, but it would have taken way too long. And this, once you know how to do it in your calculator, it literally takes like a minute, okay? And so if you're able to do the derivatives, do that little blue fraction over there, this stuff and then just use the calculator over and over and it came out. So you may see it in the future, I don't know. <laughs> if you think to use it. Okay, so that's really all I have for 3.7 and 3.8. So go ahead and use, if you've already finished them, you're free to go, go through the sections. But if not, then go ahead and open up your web assign and start working on yours. And then I'll go by and answer the questions if anybody's got any. Okay. And don't forget if you get have time to look at that review so you can have questions for me on Thursday. There is a new problem.
Okay, I just added that those calc formulas to module seven at the top. So if you need to reference it for all the formulas. Let's not write the answer like that. So for number four, where's number four? Here we go. This one. WebAssign will not take this. Okay. The WebAssign only wants it written like this. And then plus nine e to the nine x arc. So it's like I can't squish it in there, but but that first term it wants it as a negative exponent. Okay. It won't take it as a fraction. It just keeps saying it doesn't understand.
first one. Oh no. So it's secant of zero point four times tangent of zero point four. So it's secant of zero point four times tangent of zero point four. Oh no, tangent of zero point four. So it's the mirror of that two. One. The derivative of x. Oh, okay. I will see. No, no, no. Do okay. the derivative of a function and then just put in the number. Okay.
Thank you. 